Oh, thank you. Oh. Thank you, Siri. <laughs> Yes. Okay. Greetings, everyone. We are recording. This is Corey Harris, your host with the Five Points International Interview Series. This week, we're graced with the presence of the Honorable Brother Cedric Watson. How's it going, brother? How you doing, brother? Doing good. Doing good. It's good to see you again. Mm -hmm. Hey, good to see you, too. I want to invite everyone, if you're watching for the first time, to like share and subscribe because the more you do that the more we can grow and uh, impress the youtube algorithm and let them know that what we're doing is worthwhile so yeah without further ado so um how you doing today brother doing pretty good i got off to a good morning and um yeah just uh feeling blessed feeling good how about All you right. i'm doing good you know just uh Holding on, you know, I was uh been um really thinking about different aspects of the culture, you know, uh specifically uh just recently I was uh I shared it on my page, a video from a brother Barry Payton in uh, New Orleans talking about Congo Square. You I guess you're aware of how they want to uh develop Congo Square and maybe you could talk about that, your impressions about that, of course, you know. I really, I, I really don't know anything about that. Okay, okay. Well, um, I don't know much about it either, but I know that there is a proposal um, and the, the, the land is threatened. Oh. And I know that there is a community um, movement towards getting um, some action to protect the land. Well, ain't you this know, crap? You know, when I was living there, I was living in Treme, you know, and just around the corner. And so I would go to Congo Square all the time. And it was just something you almost, I don't want to say take for granted, but it was just something that was just, you could count on. It was always there. So, yeah. Yeah. So it's really weird. Um, so I'm looking up, trying to see if I see anything about that right now. Uh -huh. And because uh, I haven't heard nothing. I know there's been some crazy stuff going on. You know, it's not right around here, like uh, closing down the French Emergent School in Homa, Louisiana. That's, uh, yeah, closing down the Homa Indian uh, um, French Emergent School. Well, tell the people who the Homa Indians are, for those who don't know about the culture. Well, the Homa Indians are a tribe um, of, they're here in uh, South Louisiana, in the area that we know of, the town, even Homa that we know of, you know. And uh, mm -hmm. that's the town's named after the tribe, the Homa Indians. And um, yeah. they were they were already here when the whenever the uh, French explorers and colonizers started coming through. You know, um, mm -hmm. the Homa Indians were already here, and mm -hmm. you know we had our Takapaw, um Nation. I mean, uh, Choctaw Nation and all that. And um, mm -hmm. so uh, they had the Takapaw Indians up in this area where I live. Um, mm -hmm. Different kinds, you know, different uh, tribes, but. Um, yeah, so, but you know, as you know, a lot of Homa Indians are also of mixed descent. They're part French and, and yes. uh, part Spanish and things like that. And even some of them are part black. So, mm -hmm. but that's the, that's a Louisiana thing. You know, it's all part of that Creole culture. And these are a French speaking mm -hmm. tribe of Indians too, because they were the, some of the first people to even come into contact with the French back in those days. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. for them to shut down the French immersion program you know, that's just really, it's really, that's been a big, it's really like a uh, disappointing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I noticed you had added uh, me to a group on message, messenger on Facebook, um, a Louisiana Creole group uh, curated by a brethren uh, who had interviewed you. I saw, what is his name? Augustin, Auguste. What's his oh, name? Oh, uh, Talib August. Yes, 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 yes. I really, I was checking out his page and I was really digging, uh, you know, the movement. Maybe you could tell me some something about that. There's a very big movement going on down here right now in this area of South Louisiana. Uh, Talib August is actually a very uh, um, a brilliant, bright young brother and very smart 
and uh and full of uh, ideas and inspired you know to preserve this um louisiana creole culture and with emphasis of course i'm sure on more afro uh you know creole emphasis like i that's my you know um and i'm part of this movement too of course and uh me and tali were good associates and a lot of other people who are part of this uh tele louisian this whole group this whole uh there's so many people we have uh Christoph Landry, who's doing a lot for the Creole, um, <clears throat> he's a very knowledgeable brother too. That came out. Actually, let me go get his book. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, there's been a lot going on, man. Uh, Christoph Landry, even uh, he's one of those kind of people, these Creole activists, and uh, that are popping up out of everywhere. And these are all young people now. Chris, he's been doing it for a while too, you know. And uh, oh, you, you saw, yeah, I've seen that online. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Creola, uh, uh-huh. TV Creole. Um, you know, we have uh, Herbert Wiltz, uh, he's a part of my little organization there too. Uh, called but he's with the organization called Creole Inc. But uh, I started a thing called um, La Nation Creole, and Herbert Wiltz, um, Dr. Herbert Wiltz actually uh, is part of our La Nation Creole thing. Um, mm-hmm. and with is with emphasis on um you know afro creole and the influences of that but how we connect to even other creole cultures in the uh, world but also how um creolized people who call themselves they think that they're so acadian so much which they are of acadian descent and they are cajun and everything can't take that away from them and that has a very special part in louisiana history and they have a very unique story history but I, it's, it seems like over history, a lot of things in uh, Louisiana Creole culture have been kind of washed and pushed to, uh, the blackness out of it. And the only thing that makes it so unique really is the black and African influences. And I'm going to tell you why. It's not just because I'm black and I'm a little bit biased. It's because uh, the black, the um, West African and the um, Caribbean influence is the biggest because if the French people had just come here, and they had no interaction with slaves or had slaves at all. All it was just them, and, or even because they basically almost killed all the Native Americans down. There was still a lot of Native Americans, but they they killed them down. There were lots of Negroes, lots of Negroes everywhere. They needed them. They were slaves. They were business. They were making that meant money. <laughs> you Property. Know, and if, it, if they had not come across or not brought these Negroes here as slaves, these African people, or what they called black or Negro, then that would have never, ever been what they're calling Cajun. Mm-hmm. See? Because we know that the word Cajun is coming from uh, the word Acadian. Mm-hmm. Like, like if you say an Indian, uh, like in the Western movies, them old, uh, them colonial, them like whatever you call them, pioneers or whatever, they just lazy. They didn't say Indian, they said engine. They got some engines coming in. Y'all get your guns. You know, mm-hmm. you know, well, <laughs> around here, they call them Cajuns, you know, mm-hmm. engines, Cajuns. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> Negras, you know, Negro, Negras, no matter mm-hmm. what. You know? So, they just had their little slangs and stuff, and Cajun people, people of Acadian descent have kind of become proud of that back in the 70s or whatever. But with the, mm-hmm. you have to understand, you know, as someone that's uh, going to be saying that, 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 that gumbo is Cajun, you gotta know what the etymology and what the word Cajun is coming from. That word Mm -hmm. Acadian, which is coming out of Nova Scotia. We Mm -hmm. know gumbo come from a complete different direction. It's coming from across the Atlantic and Africa. You know, in a certain specific region in Africa and it just so happened to be where our ancestors are from. So what does that say? I wanna hide that gumbo get here. It must've came with them, you know? Mm -hmm. And which we Mm -hmm. know, you really put the seeds in the hair and braided the hair you look at these HBO movies, you see all these slaves, like they got like bro f- fraids, they got bro fades and stuff, you know, like fades from the 90s looking all, dude, no. <laughs> that wasn't what was going on, you know? They probably look more like you, <laughs> you know, they have braids yeah. and hair and stuff. So yeah, they, yeah, they, they, that's the thing they don't talk about. That's another whole another talk right there. Yes, I. You know, they, they try to make it as if it's, and, and what they did through all of this is they separated it in the in marketing. You know, they separated, you know, Creole became just black. And then Cajun became anything that's French and that's white. It ain't that easy. 
Mm-hmm. Not that easy. Oh, this is a Cajun gumbo, but when they do it, it's a Creole gumbo. No, gumbo <laughs> always been Creole. Because it's that yeah. African that came and hit that French culture and made it Creole. Because if you never would have met them Africans or you never would have brought them over here, y'all would just be French. Yeah. I mean, just, just even the idea of like adding anything spicy that's like piquant, you yeah. know, anything cayenne or anything like that, they, they, that ain't something that comes from France. No, <laughs> you know this. They can't handle too much spice in France. <laughs> you know? Uh, like when I cook for French people, I have to think about it. <laughs> I have to think about Ooh. how much pepper and take it easy. Hey, hey so, some parts of France, even ketchup be too spicy for them. You know, so there's a there's a lot of this information coming out nowadays. What we are trying to show everyone is that even the ones, see, you see, because they a lot of them did this on purpose. So now the truth is coming out and information is being shined with the younger generation. I'm talking not only uh, black people or people of color, white people, too, that are the younger generation. We're all Creole. Mm-hmm. We're actually different uh, ethnicities because you can see it. Even though some white people here are part black, you can see they white though. They just white. And then black people, like I'm part white or I'm part Native American, but I am black. I'm African. So mm-hmm. ain't with that cop thinking when he pulled me over. So uh, <laughs> you know, oh this boy got a little bit of white in him. You don't look like he's fully African. Yeah, that ain't what he thinking. So uh then he gonna beat you a little bit less. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, how about I give him uh that twenty five percent of his white blood a little bit of respect, but then I you know, yeah, right. So it ain't what a racist person go think when they're looking at me. Man, so so uh, um, even though I'm colored and that person is Caucasian, or shall I say Caucasian, even though we have that difference, we are Creole. We share the same culture. Bro, right. yeah. they got a movie called Finding Cajun. If, yeah. I think everyone should watch this movie, Finding Cajun. They got you know all these documentaries and stuff. You can get it for free on, on Amazon Prime. You can just watch it for free. It says a uh-huh. lot of stuff. But these Cajun people are Creoles, and they are. But of within that Creole culture, they are the the Caucasians of Acadian descent, which yes. makes them Cajun. Because mm-hmm. the second you have to think about this, the second that that Acadian woman brings a black man home and she says she's pregnant or something, <laughs> they married or whatever, it don't matter. That baby, when it's born, how come that baby ain't Cajun? Uh huh. <laughs> Something well, changed. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I mean, we're it's talking about rece- dominant and recessive genes, it, as well as uh, legal uh, definitions, property, you know, uh, entitlement. Like a, like a very special person once told me in my life, a man of wisdom, very old. Mm. Now, this is like, something that went with me that's something if you take you a jug of milk a whole jug and get you a tablespoon of black liquid chocolate and put it in that jug of milk and shake the hell out of it i bet you that chocolate ain't pure white no more <laughs> <laughs> that's how strong that little bit of chocolate is so mm-hmm. you see, that's just like you know it always leaves a big stamp and this culture looks more caribbean and west african than it does french Mm-hmm. Well, how do you, how does that, you know, cause I've, you know, having lived in South Louisiana and having family roots down there, uh, <clears throat> I've noticed, you know, what you're saying is exactly true. Of course, anyone who's go down there, see, this is a very Creole culture, a continuum where you see people who partake in this culture, who run the gamut, you know what I mean? I had but, some family from here, but the majority of my family is from Southeast Texas. Got some mm. South Carolina in me too, so I'm kind of like all over the place when it comes to that Southern. <laughs> you know? Right, right, right. Well, you know, one thing I've noticed that it's like a very like stark contradiction is politically. You know, you saw a lot of people who um, <clears throat> are Cajuns who like I'm sure voted for Trump or you know voted for Duke back in the day. You know, so I wonder, you know, where is is it is this is a similar situation where people like. They like the black music, but politically, they're not really trying to uh, be allies for black uh, political gains. You know, I can't, when it comes to politics, I like to kind of stay out of that a little bit, but it is important. And I can tell you personally, what I noticed was, um, like, for example, when Obama became president, 
people that are like I didn't even think they was racist, bro. <laughs> But for some reason, there was something wrong with Trump, I mean, with uh, Obama being president. And mm-hmm. then a lot of people that, that I've heard them talk about racism, and I know that they were not, or I knew they were not racist, that make little comments like, um, mainly older people, I hope this don't mean like now the blacks go come back and get us for what we did. <laughs> I've heard older people say that whenever Trump became president. And that's yeah, so funny. Real anxiety that's out there. People that, are really that fear is what makes them do the crazy shit they've done to us in the past. That that, yeah. that fear is what kept their racism. That that kind of justified their racism. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. they kind of justified their own racism and h- hatred for black people through this fear that they really have. And that's what Obama showed. Because <laughs> then, really whatever excited. Trump. Because when it came yeah. back around to Trump, man, I mean. All the racist people came out the swamps and the hills and the plains. They came running out the woods then, like, yeah! Woo, we're back! Yeah! They came louder than they were whenever it was legal for them to do the shit they were doing. (laughs) They came out out hype. They surely did. You know, but see, it's a big difference. Now they're really scared. Because when you look at them rap videos, you see them boys holding them assault rifles and stuff. (laughs) Now you know Negroes got assault rifles. You see, mm-hmm. they, see, because back in the days before civil rights, we couldn't hardly get guns. They were scared to sell us. They didn't want black people having guns, and we had them anyways, and a lot of us and stuff, but they knew that very few black people have guns in this town. You know, we mm-hmm. got the guns, so we will, we have power over them. They didn't have no fear of us. Plus, we mm-hmm. didn't really mess with them much either because we knew we'd get hanged and mutilated and everything. So... You know, even though black people did kill whites back in the days and they did rob them or do things to them that wasn't right, it was very small scale. I mean, come on, they were scared. They hurt each other before they hurt a white person. Of course, <laughs> uh, they know what ha- We always knew what happened because if you hurt one white person, you are yeah. They gonna burn person. your whole family down. <laughs> yes. Kill one white person, they gonna make on, everyone now. in your family pay that didn't even, they don't even kill people. Come on, <laughs> Oh, I know y'all yeah. good people, but we don't fucking play. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, well, I mean that's the reality, though. You know, we as black people, like for example, like the Capitol insurrection. Like, there's certain things like black folk, we just are not doing in America. We not like, you know, like we're not gonna openly like conspire online for weeks and like say the date and yeah, January sixth. We gonna storm the Capitol, and we gonna go up in there, and we gonna hang the vice president, and we and we know those get away with that even for five seconds, dude. That's the thing that America has showed us with that, bro. When I saw that, first of all, it's treason, cause I believe in America. I'm a proud American. I think mm. all the people that went in there need to be stood up in front of everybody in the country and shot, like they used to do in the military, <laughs> lined up and shot. You know, like you said, if that was twenty. Or 50 black people would have went in there and done that. They would have sprayed us down like freaking water, boy. Blood bath hey. all in that White House. That White House would have been red inside. My Lord. You know what I'm saying? So this is a really, that's what America shows us over and over again, how they feel about us. They, shows mm-hmm. us, they show us this over and over again. Mm-hmm. You know, and I want to say a cop got shot or something like that too, huh? No, the cop didn't get shot. He He's actually got a woman. He, got He's got a he got beat down and uh, he died. Um, and then they actually ruled, from what I understand, his name was Officer Brian Sicknick. And they said Officer Sicknick actually died because he had some health condition. They lied. But it seemed like to me he got killed from yeah, being he got died. beat. You, but you they officially sickly, ruled, no, it wasn't that. You know, it wasn't so. If several people beat a sickly person down, most likely that sickly person will die. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. But, and then the, there was a couple others. I think it was two others who were traumatized to the extent that they went home and uh, subsequently committed suicide. Okay. See, that's just, that's crazy. Okay, that, that cop that got beat, first of all, and died. I think everybody that went into that White House should pay. That's a lot of white people you can put in prison and make a lot of money, just like you do off of Negroes. Why don't you do it with them? 
I think so too, but you know, it's really just revealing, you know, the, this is a brother that I like to follow um, the African diaspora news channel. His name is Philip Scott. He's actually from West Louisiana, but lives in Houston. Mm. But uh, he was saying how, you know, it's a good time because this is revealing so much. Yes. And the whole time of Trump revealed so much. America revealed itself to itself. America looked itself in the mirror. Yep. for the first time i think in a long time and there was no pretense that's the one thing i don't like trump but the one thing i do like is he's in his lying he's actually honest because he's gonna lie to you in your that's face no like one it, man you all saw the video the comedy show bro you know you saw the video he know i saw the video he's still gonna lie and just like push the lie because it's not about the truth with him he's still gonna get he's away with honestly it. about he's honestly being diabolically a liar and in your face about it and you know he's not like you know smiling your face and stabbing your back he's gonna stab you in your back oh yeah anyway that's a tangent but you know i was just saying how um yeah it's 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 interesting you know this whole it, along this with whole all time, that like along with all that stuff that's happening with this racism being exposed in our country and everything like that and all this true colors coming out, that's what's happening in a small little world down here and within the uh, this area when it comes to Cajun and Creole culture too, you know? We'll speak on that a little bit. And the new movement is basically just showing uh, everyone that they're more alike than they are different, you know? Mm -hmm. But instead of taking from the black man and trying to claim and say everything came from you, or take it from the black people and try to say this and then forget about the black folks and don't even fucking mention them. Like, mm -hmm. that can't happen because history has been recorded. There's also what is just in plain sight, the truth, you know? Like, where does okra come from? Where does the word gumbo come from? What is Creole? And things like that. So things are just basically uh, coming. To, it's, and it's helping the culture grow more, you see? Because together... Together, and it's like the Haitians say, is the power. And, mm -hmm. you know, the togetherness, you know, bringing them together. Now, that's been one of my biggest um, things that I've been trying to um, do lately. That's why when you had mentioned earlier, Les Artistes Creole, I, mm -hmm. I put that little group together of people. Mm -hmm. And I, I invited you in there. But these are, we're all just artists. We all speak mm -hmm. French. We all speak Creole. Mm -hmm. We all can, you know, we can uh, collaborate. We're all powerful people, you know? I got Sun mm -hmm. Pop Barnes. I got Corey uh, Harris, you, you know? Yes. I put yes. um, Mr. Dede Saint Prix, Talib. Uh, Talib's the uh, youngest one in there. He's 18. But this really dude, is, he's a brilliant man, you know? Okay. He's a young man. He's, all, he's off to a good start. Uh -huh. He's going to do a lot for our culture and a lot for our people. And he right now what he's doing is just the beginning. When, well, you know, I'm... I'm honored to be, uh, you know, in such a esteemed company. This is great. Yeah, I love, I love what I see. Yeah, it's man, cool. I want to show you something. Speaking of Sampa, Bruce Barnes. Yeah, uh, he wrote a book called Le Coeur Creole. <laughs> ah, bon. Okay. Anybody that's into uh, New Orleans uh, Creole um, songs and culture, everything. Ah. Very interesting. Bruce Barnes. Yes. I want to ask him, it comes with a, uh, some audio too. The songs that are in here, these are old school Creole in Louisiana Creole, uh, uh -huh. New Orleans Creole songs. He even got like the music recorded, like his bandmates and stuff. They recorded different yeah. people, recorded the song. Really? I want to hear that. Really? You have a CD player in your house. Yeah, I got a CD player. A it's a, a tape player, vinyl player, and CD player in one. Oh, you got old school. It's a radio too. Go um, ahead. So Sunpa really uh he did this, man. I must say. Oh, well, Sunpa was the first uh artist I met in Louisiana. I met him back in man, must have been ninety-two, I believe. We yeah. played the Uh-huh. And he's uh he's a real powerful artist and also, you know, he's also, as you know, a park ranger, you know. Yeah, he's a retired now. See yeah. that Congo Square right there? There it is. And the song that he put for that is Don't Say Codan. I know you probably can't see it too uh -huh. well right now. Uh, Don't uh -huh. Say Codan. I, I thought this was an old Cajun song. Uh -huh. But no, this is a song that them Creoles are singing, he told me. Uh -huh. it's Don't Say Codan. This is the way I know it, more European-like, because that's the way I learned it. Don't Say Codan, Don't Say Codan, C'est ma caca le violon. 
Donc, c'est codin, donc c'est codin, c'est ma caca, je joue le violon, en morceau piment. I don't know the rest of the words because it's like, but it says, uh, en morceau piment, en bas la che poisson. So that means a uh, pepper under the butt of the fish. Uh, uh, che poisson. <laughs> chi, chi. Chi. Uh-huh. <laughs> en bas la che poisson. Chi. Che. Um, che poisson. Ça c'est chaud, ça c'est bon. Ça c'est chaud, ça c'est doux. Those are the words of the song. I need to learn this tune. But yeah, he got Dang. these old Creole tunes in here and written in Creole. And it's really That's an amazing contribution, bro. Wow. And this just came out. This book just came out, right? Yes. Uh, Le Coeur Creole. It says Creole compositions and stories from Louisiana. Stories, too. So I can't wait uh-huh. to read this because I want to put out a, um, I want to put out an album. I have a lot to talk about. So I want to be, you know, all these years I've been playing music and I've been, um, really uh you know involved in that part of the preservation of the culture the music yeah. but yeah. meeting people like sampa and seeing them do this or meeting people like talib and things i'm inspired to be more uh an activist and part of the language too because yeah, creole yeah. language in particular is very uh special to me i find to us black people even though in louisiana whites and blacks speak it but mainly whites speak french and blacks speak french and creole so, so, but Creole is the language developed from slaves. So it's obvious where it's coming from, the language and everything. And, and it's something that's very, uh, it was considered low class for a while. So that a lot of black people just started speaking only Creole French instead of Creole. Like they started speaking Louisiana French. Right. But back in the old day, black people, man, they knew how to speak Creole and French because that's just, they had to survive. They didn't want the white oh, yeah. And the white people couldn't understand Creole that well in a lot of, in most places. So right. Louisiana got these, like where I live here in St. Martin Parish, whites and blacks speak Creole and they call it Cudi Vini. But, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. that's not normal for, uh, run come. <laughs> in most cases, that's not. Uh, Cudi Vini, run come. It is normal because this is what's happening here, right? Or if you go yes. down to Chuck Bay, you know, in Louisiana, you got a lot of uh, whites that speak in Vachery, a lot of whites speak Creole. But if you go anywhere yes. else in the world where people speak Creole, like Guadeloupe, Haiti, places like that, the majority of the white people don't speak Creole. They speak French. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I hope I'm correct because that's the way I've always seen it. <coughs> um, I think from what I from what I've heard, there are some white folk who speak Creole. Yeah, yeah, they blanc qui 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 parle Creole en Guadeloupe, no? Yes. Oh yeah, they're, 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 they're white folk who speak Creole down there because they got the the, the blanc pays. Mm-hmm. Il y a des blancs pays là. Des siècles. Yeah, so they since slavery, just like you know, they have settler white folk who there, who've been there for generations. Who by now they would know Creole, you know. Yeah, they pretty much got to, you know. <laughs> you know what I mean? But back in the accent Creole, c'est différent, no. But within, and maybe that's what happened here. You know, maybe it's just because of being together for so long. Maybe they just. At some point, the white started speaking Creole, because that's pretty much what she's saying. They they pretty much in swimming in the the bath of the people. That's so it. They're, they're drinking mom. They drinking uh, the nanny's old. <laughs> they drinking old nanny's milk. <laughs> you know, so they pretty much talk like everybody. Yep. Yeah. I mean, when you look at it, you know, it's like in America. Look, I've been in situations like one time I was in Avondale, right. I got a good homie living in Avondale, uh, Brother Harry Dennis, Okuo Dennis. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think I was on my way to visit him. Anyway, I was in the gas station and uh, waiting to pay to you know buy my gas. And I heard what I thought was two young brothers behind me. You know, like, what's up, nigga? You know, how you doing, man? You know, you know I'm like, listen how they talk. <laughs> yeah. I'm just thinking, you know, this has got to be, you know. And I turned around these two white boys and I was oh, like, oh, yeah. You know, like really white boys, you know. Oh yeah. And then the whole way they was relating was my N word, and you oh, know. Oh man, they real bad the with that. The whole New York. style, the whole everything, the the yeah. I was like, okay, you know. You know, in New York, they real bad with that. Like every, no matter what color you are, no matter what. Hey nigga, so look, nigga, nigga, no, nigga, look up. They, it's like, what? In the, what the hell is this? But you know. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I'm, and you know, I'm born and raised in the South, like my whole life, and the word nigga was a big word. Like, that's all we say in, you know, growing up. But I don't say nigga hardly no more. I might say it like 
three times a day to keep my teeth white. That's about it, you know? I don't, I don't, I don't use the word nigga too much. I put nigga. that word to sleep a long time. You know, I don't like, I don't have a meltdown over it, but I don't use it. I say it, you know, I, what I mean, because I like how I was, grew up hearing the word nigga. But the way they're saying it is like in a ghetto, like too much, man. Because I don't like saying that word. I just say it by habit. <laughs> Well, you know, there's a whole impulse when you look at it in American culture of reverting to black culture and using it like a raw resource, a raw material for authenticity. Yeah. It's like the juice for they the, for they engine, you know, so how See, they no, did I with country music, how they did with rock and roll, how they did with, you know, everything they do, they're going to go and dip back. And so it's the same with the N word because it's almost like a delicacy. You can see a lot of them be like, well, y'all say it. Y'all say it so now. It yeah, we're in the same social setting and everything. And see, I'm here <laughs> like you. You know, I didn't yeah. Say, I, and look at it. And a lot of them say this. I didn't say nigger. I said nigga. Yeah, right. I like, do. Like, <laughs> look. <laughs> yeah, they try to save itself. Southern aristocrats. They didn't pronounce their R so hard either. And they said nigga. Not nigga hey, over there. Either way, the vibe gets the same vibe in return. No matter what, the word nigger is nigger. Yay, whatever you say. We know the history, so don't be playing with my mind. Yeah, I try to play all that. I, I didn't say, and that's just bull crap, man. But, but, you know, a lot of them white folks, man, a lot of them, they got good parents, got a good job, everything. I mean, like good people. And they still go out uh, in the streets dressing like they some thug and trying to, what they, what they see as being black or hip. It's just sure. all like floppy like a thug and shit, and they're going around saying, man, nigga, what? No, real talk, no, nigga. And then whenever they get around their parents, in front of your face, they'll be like, um, dad, so are you and mother going <laughs> to, you know, they change up. <laughs> yeah, so, of course. So I, the way course. I see it is, dude, let them keep uh, taking all this ignorant bullshit that they basically, ancestors who did us wrong, created. You know what I'm saying? Let them adopt all that ignorant shit about our culture and think it's cool. Because that's what's going on. Well, the thing is, is that ain't even our culture. N-word and, you know, all these uh, ways of relating to each other, that is not our culture. That that's is not our, that's what not our... Have, That is what is the illness, the affliction that we have been left with. That's what society has we created. Have to get yeah. back. Exactly. We got to get back to our culture. Because really, the first nigga is the white man, when you think about it. Because we're only that in relation to them. As long as we're aping them, we are that N-word. Yeah. You know, we are that person who is failing to realize who he is, who is failing to realize his true potential, who is aping, That's you know, who is always them. Be copying. Like they, we should let them do what they, all that crap they think they are uh, imitating and being, you know, stupid. And we need to move ourselves up and go this direction while they go in that direction. You see what I mean? Because exactly. them same idiots that's acting like that, them same ones that's selling it and putting it out there, they the ones that's, that created it. You know, society yeah. society created that that actual, what they call the ignorant hood nigga. Society, right. you know, like you said. So, yeah, let mm -hmm. them. Let them take on them traits and act. let white people act like that. Go ahead. To me, that's just Amos fun. Amos Wilson. That Amos Wilson, he said, they can't, they can't be what they are unless we are what they want us to be. Right. In so many words, you know, so as long as we play our role, that's what gives them the juice for their whole game, you know? Let me tell you how bad, black, how bad white people want to be black, some of them. Not all mm -hmm. of them, because really the majority of them wouldn't have never want to be no Negro. <laughs> but uh, some of them want to be black so bad that they will actually tell me I'm blacker than you. Just because you talk with the real talk, you blacker than me. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, just, that's just a real, that's a very the racist thing to say, a very deep but, insult. But some of them, just because they dress like, a, let's say hip hop, or they talk, or they talk real talk, they would yeah. tell me, a white person, that they're blacker than me. And to me, right. that's just some funny shit, bro. Right. But I mean, that's a that's a white supremacist impulse. They're trying to control the black man. They're trying to, you know, like control you and define you. Because what, what that wannabe wigger don't know is he telling me, a black man, he blacker than me. He don't even know that black people don't even say that to each other. Dumbass no. idiots. I'm, no. I'm, more, I'm more black than you. 
bro, I'm blacker than you. I'm more black. You know, we don't sit around like certain things we just uh, don't have in our uh, mentality. Not a conversation. We don't black people not don't sit around uh, uh, loading guns, saying, "Man, I'm getting ready for my race war kickoff." <laughs> you don't never hear no damn black people talking about no race war, getting ready, stacking up bullets. <laughs> We came in. You know that's right. Regular people like me came and get no fucking bullets because the white folks are scared of us buying them all up. Mm-hmm. On purpose. Mm-hmm. You know, and people hear me talk about these subjects. Oh, you're racist. I'm not racist. Now, if you want to say racist, like uh, I'm very proud of my race and my roots. Hell yeah, I'm racist. But I ain't mm-hmm. no racist. I'm not. A, but I damn sure ain't no evil racist. Or like I hate whites and I hate everyone else that ain't black or nothing. But, well, I, I like to uh, I like to ask people what is their definition because race, racist, racism, it is used as a tool depending on how the person feels. Like they're white people who are raised in a so-called colorblind, but really just like ignoring racism because of white privilege, not having to talk about it. So whenever the subject comes up. They be like, oh my God, it's racist because they talking about race, and That's we're not right. supposed to talk about race because it's racist to talk about race. Yeah. And so said it's racist. He's talking about race. <laughs> you know exactly what you just said and did right there is what happens to me a lot, especially yeah. if they've been drinking. Yeah, especially if they've been drinking. But yeah. see, but see, whenever I bring that subject up, that's real talk. That's fucking reality. Mm-hmm. But they don't want to mm-hmm. hear that. You see what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'm blacker than you. What we're seeing is like we got drastically different definitions of American history. Like these people, and I'm just putting them in a group, but like, you know, white folks who are not even trying to check on the history of black folk or American history or anything and are not really caring about their fellow citizens is what I'm talking about. Like a lot of them, they don't know about the history. They don't know. They've not been educated, you know. And so it's like, they have a drastically different reality. You know, we see that time and time again, you know, like with, this, with this insurrection. And they hate that, that they have a different reality too. They want to like kind of, they don't want to realize that like they can't be. No, we're all living in 2021. We're all right here with each other. How can you have a different reality from me? That's just the way it is. Nah. A whole nother reality way of looking yeah. at life when you walk out of your door every day and your skin is brown. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, one thing I noticed too, though, is, uh, you know, there's the iconic photo of the dude walking with the Confederate flag in the uh, Capitol Rotunda. And I heard just recently that a judge let him and his son go off to vacation somewhere. <laughs> you know, so I was just thinking, just think if that was a brother. Just think if that was like me walking through there with the RBG. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you know, and uh, there's a whole, a whole, a whole squad of people behind me. No, uh, uh-uh. uh, no, we wouldn't have made it that far. You know, so no. <laughs> it's interesting. I'm looking to see what sort of musical um, reactions. I, I even wrote a song called "Chicken Come Home to Roost" that I'm gonna record pretty soon here. Um, I call it "Insurrection Blues." Chicken Come Home to Roost. Mm-hmm. But I want to see what uh, other musical reactions there are because that whole event sonically, like just to hear, like just listen to the videos and hear the way like Trump whipped the crowd up and then hear the way them people was talking, how they stormed the Capitol, just sonically, it was like a heavy metal show, like a mosh pit or like a, yeah. a punk rock show, like very violent, you know what I mean? And I was like just tripping on that. And I'm thinking musically, how are creatives going to process this? So I'm waiting to see. Yeah, a lot is going to come out of this stuff, you know? Yo. But uh, I think the world, the things, things are going to change, you know? Things yeah. are changing. And that's why you see all of these uh, people going, becoming resilient and crazy and like freaking, you know, because they, they feel like that this is a threat to their empire that they built on racism. Of and course. And in, uh, in injustice. Of course. That's why they don't want us talking about it. They say this, don't even talk about the critical race theory, yep. 1619 project, all that. Just shut up. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's fine. Columbus discovered America. Be quiet. It's narrowing down. And they know mm-hmm. that they're in the spotlight. It's narrowing mm-hmm. down. Mm-hmm. But it's going to take a while because, um, you know, there's still. Um, 
there's still a, a, a contingent of power and elitism in, in, in the country and in the world that has the right talk. And you know, you know like they're going to talk about, they're going to have come with the right talks as far as talking about, you know, Black Lives Matter and anti-racism and white supremacy. But look, you know, like, for example, Patrice Cullors has four houses worth more than a million dollars each. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, okay, Mike Brown, by the way, his family, after he got killed, they got 500 bucks total. And the head of Black Lives Matter is buying million dollar houses around the world. Yeah. Not just in America, but in the Bahamas, chilling, in Dan Beverly Hills, chilling, in Atlanta, chilling. You know what I'm saying? So yeah, why don't you give some yeah. of that Black Lives Matter to the lives that matter? <laughs> I'm telling you, you know, Black like Lives Tamir Matter, Rice's right? mama. Tamir right. Rice's mama came out, was like, yo, I, I'm like broke. I can't even hardly pay my rent. What y'all doing? Because the Black Lives Matter, they're putting out all these movies and stuff, too, that are popular, you know? And that's what's probably, you know, a lot of stuff is, I mean, it's just crazy. This Black Lives Matter thing became like a movie production thing and everything. <laughs> I mean. I thought it was just like these, like, people, like, young black folks, like, trying to fight for the fact that black lives do matter and for people to be aware of it. That's what I thought it was. But now it's like a I big mean, old. Yeah. To me, it's like. If it's like to me, okay, let's just imagine now, okay, we have this whole media world, media is connected with activism, connected with entertainment. It's all one thing in the internet. It's all one big beast. But yeah. to me, it's like the same, like just imagine if Harriet Tubman now went on tour with P.T. Barnum in the Ringling Barnum Bailey Circus, or Harriet Tubman now went on a damn minstrel show. Because that was the popular <laughs> at the time, right? It would never happen, right? Yeah. Harriet Tubman ain't going on no minstrel show. She ain't going to no Grammys. She's like she America's most wanted, bro. Uh, uh, you know, she out there with her gun. She out there, you know, getting things done, freeing yeah. people. She's straight you up know? soldier. You know what I'm saying? Come yeah. on. So I'm just, I'm just not feeling that energy at all. You know, I mean, yes, theoretically, my life matters. Our lives matter. Black lives matter. But... I don't even feel like I should be having to say it. Right, you, you shouldn't know? even have to fucking say that. Because I'm going to show you my life matters. Yeah. I'm not going to be out here like, oh, my, my life matters. No. no. No, I'm going to show you. You'll get consequences. Yeah, right. That's exactly. how it is. That's, <laughs> yeah. That's all this, like, pity me, bull crap, and he did this, she did that. Like, that little boy walking to that damn church and shot them black people up, that preacher man and all them black people in that church in South Carolina, remember? That little boy, where is he right Del now? Rose. Where's that little boy at right now? He fucking Del, he, he at Burger King, bro. Yeah, you know I mean he eating. That's what I was just gonna say. He eating it <laughs> by looking at TV somewhere. You know, he in a drive-through, bro. <laughs> there's no that that should be a group of black people. I, I don't care what no one says about me saying this. There should be a group of black people that put on some mask. I don't care if they put on hoods and go secretly get that little boy and cut his ass into pieces. No, I'm telling he you, actually boy. He deserves that, and that's justice. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah that, isn't that what they used to do to us? For nothing? It's true. But you know what happened? You know what happened? What America thinks is justice now is this boy, I don't know how much money he got. I'll have to research this. He needs a but counselor, Dylan Roof, a therapist. On, 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 but on GoFundMe, Dylan Roof, he got, ooh, I want to say several hundred thousand dollars what? of a fund where people... Anonymous people, similar to Kyle Rittenhouse, another hero of the far right, you know, who got a whole bunch of money for being a killer. So, yeah, serious time. Oh. Well, see, yeah, that's, uh, you know, uh, that. That case right there really got me. Okay, we know the cops like killing all those kids, getting away with it, and killing all the black people, getting away with it. That's been happening over the years, right? So we saw mm. that. But that little that boy, I say little boy, but that eighteen year old, whatever he was, teenager boy, walked into that church and killed. And it just so happened that preacher man, he was a very important person. Yeah. In black community and during the civil rights, even and everything. He was a state. He was a uh, he was a state elected uh, official as well. 
That's a that was a set that was set up to happen. Someone put that. Yeah, he was in public that. office and they didn't like him. And this boy, he went in there and prayed with those people. He did Bible study and prayed with them and killed them at the end. That is really evil. That's what's messed up too. Boy, went in there and prayed with them and everything and killed them at the end. That is yo. crazy. Yo, yo, come on. He got away now. and got away with it. Yeah, and got money, got paid. That is ridiculously crazy. Yeah, so you know, we can't we can't be we got to stop being shocked and know we dealing and we, with and quit being some damn uh feel sorry for me. Somebody fuck with Thank me. You. They going to get sprayed. Thank Just, you cuz that's that's the old school. You know, I really I really don't like it when I see certain people in our in our in our community, most of young people having signs saying, you know, we are not our ancestors, you know. But if you look at it, our ancestors, they whipped some ass. They were strong. They, they put some lead in, in some behinds. They the made second, people think twice. They made people scared. They ran people out. They ran the clan hey, out of many places. You hey, know? And I know this for a fact from talking to black people that are still living that saw it and did it. Whenever black people got their rights, civil rights, and they heard it on the television being announced and shit, they was fucking happy. And all mm -hmm. the white people was still trying to try them because they was used to that. They was used to getting their way and try and treating mm -hmm. black people like shit. Dude, they mm -hmm. was busting them white folks up left and right around here, bro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. now, I hate to say it like that, busting them white folks up and everything. I know it sounds pretty uncomfortable for a white person to hear that, but fuck yeah. Because if, mm -hmm. if you mess with me, no matter what color you are, you're going to get fucked up. But if you mess with a white person want to try to be racist and belittle me, or if a white person want to uh, try to threaten my life, they going to get sprayed. Mm -hmm. We all mm -hmm. got guns. I ain't scared of your ass. <laughs> we all and got guns. Say if you are, I think I, it sums it best. They say if you are against my existence, yeah. expect my resistance. Thank you. You know, I mean, self-preservation, that's the primary law. You know, we all have to take care of ourselves. Yeah. You know. We got to preserve ourselves, our families, you know, and that's what it is. It's just being able to live life, have equal access to things, you know, express ourselves, be our culture, be who we are, you know what I mean? So, but I wanted to, um, speaking about culture, I wanted to know um, if we could bring it to the music and if you would uh, mind playing a, a song or two for the people. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Let me get my... Grab my accordion. Yeah, I got my accordion here. That's mm -hmm. like the main instrument in the music that I play. Yes. And it's crazy because like this accordion, you know, the idea of these, the kind of accordions that we play and stuff come from like Poland and all that. And, you know, this is a German, like they use them and stuff like that, European. But when mm -hmm. we got this accordion in our hands, you know, as colored people, we invented a whole nother style of playing accordion on that thing. That was not, mm -hmm. you know. Let's see. Uh... Thank you. 
the deep blue sea where we need to be. So, um, who was, uh, who, who was, uh, I mean, I know you told me before, but if you could just remind the, the viewers, who are your big inspirations in the, in the music now, in the accordion, and, and I know you play the fiddle as well. Well, uh, the majority of my inspiration, um, they all did, you know, but they, you know, they're musicians of the past, but then I got a lot of people that are very, uh, a lot of my musical peers of today that are very inspiring to me too. Um, no. A lot of the uh, older legends that passed away, though, they were very inspiring. Well, Amade Ardoin, you know, no. like one of the first in the 20s to record um, Louisiana French music. But due to the uh, racist, basic, basically racist hate crime, he's dead. He died. He probably would have lived to make it to the 70s, Lord knows. But, um, mm -hmm. and you know, but he laid down a very hardcore foundation on what Louisiana accordion playing sounds like. Um, mm -hmm. Then he had, um, you know, so many, so many people inspired me, man, to do what I do. You know, like J.B. Adams and Edward Poulard, who I recorded uh, Les Amis Creole on the Arli Arhuli Records. We recorded a project called Les Amis Creole. They were like two godfathers for me. Um, mm -hmm. um, Creoles of color that really cared about uh, the black influence in the old school um, way of playing Creole music, like what we call La La. I got into mm -hmm. that, you know. Um, but a, a lot of, you know, Bojak, even a more modern style of playing, yeah. he was very inspiring to me too. I got to meet Bojak. Uh, Keith Frank and Jeffrey Broussard, who are still living, they have been a, yeah. big, a great big ins inspiration. Um, mm -hmm. Also, like Marc Savoie, uh, um, He's like the best Cajun accordion player that, in my opinion, you know, he's the best yeah. Cajun accordion player. He's been a big inspiration too to me. Um, his style. Um, does he not? Was he? Does he? Uh, is he an artisan? Does he make instruments yeah, he actually, as well? Yeah, he actually makes accordions. The the Cadian accordion. Another wow. accordion, another accordion maker that I mentioned too earlier was Ed Poulard. He's been making uh. some really nice accordions too. Ah, uh. years. You know, okay. Be, I go to Junior Martin. Uh, uh -huh. He's an accordion maker, but he works on my accordions too, uh, Junior Martin. 
Um, I would like to see that process sometime, how that is made. Oh, man, when you come down, I can take you to an accordion shop or two, for sure. Let's really, go. Really, really Let's interesting. Go. Yeah. But um, and a lot of my friends uh, who I play music with are great inspirations to me, too, you know? Because they're just so yes. awesome. You know, like you even, you know? Uh, even though, you know, you play guitar, I play accordion, you know, but it's like, or I play fiddle, you play guitar, but it's like, you're a great inspiration to me. Um, Thanks. Uh, who else? Like, you know, a lot of musicians I travel with, like Eric Bibb. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dirk Powell, you know. Yeah. Dirk is great, man. A very big, they're very big inspirations uh, for me. How badass uh -huh. they are and just comfortable and. Hey. Yeah, real quality individuals and like really like living and breathing the music, you know, and doing it in a humble way. Both of those names you just mentioned. Yeah, and there are many, there's so many others, you know, if I didn't mention you, mm -hmm. y'all get mad about it or whatever, too bad for y'all. But you know, I love you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, don't worry, don't worry. Yeah, some, people, all, uh, some people really do get offended by stuff. You ain't mentioned me, boy. Uh, well, too bad. Well, um, I wanted to um, end up just, could you, would you mind playing a fiddle song for the people? Cause I like how you play the yeah. fiddle. Let me see. The fiddle plays a big part in the uh, you know, African American heritage. Yes. You know, I was reading recently um, in uh, Sterling Stuckey's book, Slave Culture. Sterling Stuckey wrote this 405 page book and talking about, you know, the, the, the cultural bedrock that, that, that we stand on, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. saying that the fiddle took the place of the drum, you know, that was the drum. Yeah, it's so rhythmic. And he said in, in, in most places, uh, it could be like one out of 10 people was a fiddler. So oh, fiddlers yeah. were everywhere. Oh, yeah, man. And the people that couldn't afford a fiddle made their own. I'm from Fiddlers. My my great-great-grandfather was a fiddler from Virginia. Oh, yeah? That's cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm about to play is a song that I learned from listening to Dennis McGee and a friend of mine, Kevin Wimmer. Uh, it's called Pas Janvier. And everywhere I go in the world and play this tune, I always call it uh, 1800s R&B. <clears throat> but Dennis McGee was born in the uh, 1890s. And when he was like five years old or something like that, he said he remember, he said he was just a little boy. He remembers uh, this uh, mulatto lady, a uh, light-skinned black lady, you know, uh, she was, should sing this song. She was really, really beautiful, uh, blue dress. She would sing this song. And her husband played the violin and he was... Uh, this dark, dark skinned black dude wearing a fancy suit. He had white hair. He was older than her. And uh, he would play the fiddle when she would sing this tune. It's called Pas Janvier. This is like in the 1800s, so that's why I call it 1800s R&B, you know? Don't 
qui me la donne pas, parce que moi j'aime trop, j'aime trop Pauline, oh, Pauline, ma chatte Pauline, qui moi j'aime autant. C'est trop fort ça, ça, ça me rapporte, oui. Yes. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Merci beaucoup, merci mon frère. Hey, well, well, thank you, bro. Um, I guess uh, in closing, uh, if there's anything you want to let the people know, of course, let them know how they can get in touch with you on social media. Anything else you want to let the people know about what you got coming you can, up? You can find me on social media. I'll be wearing a straw hat and a white shirt and holding my accordion like this. Mm -hmm. Looking that <laughs> <All> <laughs> right. That's how you find me on social media on Facebook, uh, Cedric Watson. Mm -hmm. and my band is called Bijou Creole. Um, also, uh, I have a couple of self-produced albums um, you can find on um, like you know Amazon and uh, uh, iTunes. Uh, well, you're very, you're very humble because you ain't say you Grammy nominated. Well, yeah, I was Grammy nominated like four times. I, I was with the Pine League Boys and we were nominated in that band. Then uh, as a as my own Cedric Watson, you know, solo artist or whatever. Um, well, with my band actually, uh, I've been nominated another three times. Um, okay, you gonna hit it one of these days. Yeah, and uh, I'm working on another album right now. Hopefully, we'll have that out in a couple of months. So, uh, yeah, good. Still good, doing good. it, rolling it, and uh, during during COVID, you know, it was kind of a different thing because I didn't have any tours. But I had to do a lot of solo. I kind of discovered uh, myself a little more on the solo when I played solo gigs and things and kind of became a tighter musician when I played solo, you know? So, mm -hmm. audience playing is more tighter, you know? Me too. Yeah. <laughs> but it's the same thing, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, something good came, thing. good stuff came out of COVID, you know? Mm hmm. <laughs> wow. Well, that's good. Well, look, uh, you know, I appreciate it, bro. Um, I think that's about it. I want to um, thank everyone for watching this edition of Five Points International Interview Series. Of course, you can like, share, and subscribe. We got a few other videos that we hope that you will check out when you have the time. And again, thank you again, Brother Cedric Watson. Thank and you. until next time, peace, yes, power, sir. respect, best yes, of love. Sir. Yes. <laughs>